Okay. Um, this is going to be a really a general catch up with what I've been doing during my absence, so it's not really following on from the DevOps stuff. But it kind of sort of is. So, what have we been doing in the last week or so? Uh, <clears throat> I've been working on a couple of projects. Um, I think we've already, I've already mentioned that I want to automate the document processing that I need to do. Uh, and one of the ways uh, I'm doing that is with uh, this document processing uh, project. Um, uh, now, I got a bit carried away uh, working on this. Um, uh, I, I revisited the uh, setup, the Vagrant setup stuff, um, and split out a few things. So, for example, I'm now differentiating uh, what I'll call sort of core provisioning. That is stuff that I'm pretty sure is going to be in all of my projects. Uh, from the project specific provisioning uh, and then that is still separated from the personal provisioning uh, which is just my personal preferences for a particular VM and of course the personal secure which is things like my private SSH keys and stuff like that but all of those things eventually want to make their way somehow into the virtual machine to make it <coughs> comfortable uh, so the, really these first two, uh, personal secure and personal provisioning, are really idiosyncratic and, and just depend on my personal preferences of what I want to put into the machine. Uh, the project provisioning will be different for each project. Uh, and the provisioning uh, is just the sort of general, uh, this will go into everything kind of provisioning. So uh, if I uh, look at this dot proc, um, Let's have a look. What have I got? Uh, I've got in the in the core provisioning. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm putting in uh, Docker as a matter of course because that's needed to support concourse. Now, why am I putting concourse in here? Because it makes it easier for the development and testing of the individual build tasks, uh, which ultimately will be the things submitted for any project into the overall sort of build um, pipelines, you know, the workflows for concourse. Uh, so having your own local copy is actually quite useful because you can test out pipelines, you can test out tasks uh, within the limits, obviously, of the capabilities of your virtual machine. Or virtual machines, uh, because of course concourse you can spread it out over several machines if you needed to. But really it's anticipated as being <clears throat> there to be able to run tests on tasks and we will revisit that in a moment. Um, and then I've got this uh, install standard script uh, which uh, uh, is really just uh, uh, making sure that the bash profile runs both the bash rc and the dot profile and again coming back to what i talked about uh in a, in a sort of previous uh video uh when these things get run and who modifies them tends to vary uh, for example if you've got a bash profile then your dot profile uh, will likely not be run unless you've done this sort of jiggery pokery uh, furthermore, your bash RC uh, should only be run when you're interactively logged in, that is you're um, logged into a shell for example. Um, but you won't always, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes if you're logged in and running something directly from say an SSH command that isn't running a shell, uh, your bash RC won't get run unless, uh, but your bash profile will, <clears throat> um, or, or your profile will. So it can be a bit of a bugger's muddle sometimes. So to get around that problem, um, unless you're 
concerned specifically about security i wouldn't recommend doing this on privileged accounts generally uh, uh it, it's it's not not a big issue on a virtual machine because we consider those to be relatively sacrificial um but uh for example um you, if you're running uh, a privileged operation you may want to strip the path back to only being very specific things uh, which is the reason why you will often find that when you're running a privileged job uh, as for example root you're running it remotely you'll often find that the path variable will be completely unset uh, and that's precisely because of this security issue that anything on the path will be accessible to a uh, anyone who can run those commands so um, yeah so th there's a good reason for not doing what i'm doing here uh, and that is for security reasons so again if you're running anything on a a privileged account uh, on a sensitive machine then you really shouldn't do this <clears throat> uh, but on uh, machines that are completely under control or uh, in this case on sacrificial machines that don't have access to uh, other facilities I, I don't see any harm uh, it also uh, does this touch on this st commit message it turns out that this uh, st commit message which is really just the template file this is just an empty file um, <clears throat> the template file is used by git when you uh, for example when you do a, a, a git commit um, it gets filled in as the sort of default text uh, for a message and it's useful for if you've got a sort of pro forma way of laying out all of your commit messages um, I don't uh, but what I have discovered is that uh, with certain ways of installing git you don't get this st commit message uh, file uh, output and it causes problems so I just create a blank one uh, and that gets around that problem uh, and by using touch it means that if the message already exists uh, you know if that file already exists then nothing happens uh, well I suppose technically the modification date gets changed but uh, you know you, you don't overwrite it that's kind of cool right yes so that's the sun insult you also notice that I've divided up the um, <clears throat> you've divided everything up into root and vagrant uh, so you know root scripts get run as root and the vagrant scripts get run as the vagrant user so in other words it's basically a division between privileged and non-privileged jobs uh, you'll also notice that now i've started numbering this is sort of after the old you know in it rc type structure just to get an order uh, these scripts are run in the order that they would be output by a list or a directory or in this case by a tree so you can tell which order they're going to be running if necessary uh, a lot of things you'll see i are installed 99 because i don't really care what order they get running um, uh, uh, but i do know that maybe things will be run before them so this being the documentation project for example under project provisioning uh, the route is to install tech live which is actually quite a prolonged process uh, and this tech life profile just tells it what to install in the tech life because i don't need everything uh, and you'll notice that under vagrant i've now got this installed tech life for the salty vagrant books which is the specific parts that are need to be installed for a non-privileged user <clears throat> uh, now the core uh, uh, so this is the script that gets run regardless uh, so this is the script that drives the whole thing okay and uh, i've made a couple of uh, small uh, improvements here simplified it considerably there's very little in there now there's really just these two routines uh, one which runs things as root and one which runs things as vagrant uh, and you'll notice that the only real difference is that uh, other than the messages are uh, that this one really literally just runs the script and this one it uses the run user to run in the context of the uh, vagrant user and you can see uh, all I do is I do an update uh, I've commented out the upgrade up here because on Debian Buster uh, there's something broken about the uh, upgrade process it pulls in a, um, a grub boot 
uh, a grub loader that, uh, for the boot that, that basically breaks the virtual chain. So I've avoided that for the time being. I haven't tried it for a week or so, so maybe they fixed it. <clears throat> um, but down here, you can see all we do is we install uh, the root and vagrant for the core install. Then we install the root and vagrant for the uh, uh, project. And then we install uh, the root and vagrant for the personal stuff. In fact, uh, that doesn't sound right. Let's just do a git pull on this. Uh, I had a feeling I'd change the order of those. Uh, however, maybe I didn't. Um, so basically, it goes uh, install the standard stuff, install the project stuff, then install the personal stuff. Uh, and that's all that's about, really. Uh, so it doesn't chain on anymore because it used to, if you remember, it, it was uh, originally it was it would run the core stuff, which then would call the vagrant stuff, and the vagrant stuff would then, uh, you know, the personal stuff, and then the personal stuff would do all sorts of magic. Now it's divided up a bit better, a bit easier to manage. Uh, what this means is <coughs> that uh, these are now different repositories. Okay, so the the core repository really only contains this provisioning directory and the vagrant file and the readme. Uh, and uh, personal secure isn't a Git repository at the moment. Uh, it's just a uh, a copy of various files from my uh, standard installs. Uh, the project provisioning is its own Git repository. So if I go into uh, project provisioning, you can see it's its own. Uh, it's its own uh, Git repository. Okay, it's got nothing to do with project. So that it's checked out separately. Uh, now. Uh, there is a way of doing this with Git modules. Uh, I've not bothered with this project. Um, and in general, uh, the idea is that you'll check out the, you, you know, you'll clone the standard developer VM and then you'll clone the project into it. And the same goes for the personal stuff. Uh, if we go into, go into personal, uh, well, actually, I should just show you this. Um, okay, so. You can see here that these remotes, uh, this is for the, uh, oh, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, so the upstream is the developer VM, uh, but this is, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, so the way I've done it is, um, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. In this particular project, the way I've done it is uh, the, the Git project, uh, what am I doing? Brain fart. Uh, sorry. Yeah, the way I've done it is that the the, the core project um, is has got the uh, the upstream is the developer VM. So that's the thing that was originally uh, cloned. Then I added the project stuff, and then I moved it to uh, and then the origin, which is the sort of the default, is the project specific version of the VM, which has got the project directory added in. So I can pull any uh, any updates uh, from uh, that might be why it didn't show up. Let's just do git pull upstream, okay? Because we pulled origin rather than uh, upstream. Ah, there we go. Uh, so now, uh, if I now look at uh, provisioning core, I think the order is different now at the bottom here. Uh, uh, project personal, project personal. Uh, nope. <laughs> what do you know? Uh, but you can see I have pulled something in. Uh, uh, ah, idiot. Uh, let's pull it from the master. I uh, uh, yep, I'll do. Uh, yeah, there we go. Finally. Uh, obviously my brain is not functioning correctly today. There we go, that's what I was expecting. Okay, so it just installs all the roots and then it installs all of the vagrants. Uh, so that you can be sure that all the all the priv uh, all the privileged stuff is never going to rely on something from the local vagrant stuff. Okay, but the vagrant stuff might very well rely on stuff being installed from the root.
Um, and you can see here that um, we install the personal before the project uh, so that they get private keys and config are available, okay, because personal installs all the SSH keys. <clears throat> and when it comes to, to check out the project, um, it's using that salty vagrant uh, UR, uh, URL. Yeah, so if I go to um, uh, this is uh, the problem here is because I haven't actually updated this for a while. Uh, but if I uh, where am I? What am I, what am I trying to show you? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. If I go into um, uh, go into the project. Uh, I don't know. My brain's leaking out my ears today. Uh, so if I go into the personal, uh, right, uh, the structure of most things I think is different to this one. This one's a bit odd. Um, I think in uh, let's go into. Let's go into the, the other project I've been fiddling around with. Um, uh, on, there we go. This Pi Builder. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm actually in the virtual machine there. Oh, so this is. Yeah, so this is a this is a machine I'm building for my dad basically. Uh, not not this. It's the the pies of what I'm building for my dad, um, and that's what's been distracting me recently. Uh, so git connect um, minus b, and uh, so the upstream is developer VM, and we've got this here as dad's our pie VM. Uh, if we go into project. Uh, yeah, so I've done the same thing here. Um, but anyway, long story short, uh, yeah, uh, these things here, okay, uh, at the level of my Mac are going to be using the configuration for SSH on the Mac. Uh, but when it comes to uh, sorry, uh, when it comes to uh, in here. Uh, and I want to install the repositories, okay, uh, then uh, project provisioning, vagrant, install, okay, so you can see here it installs a whole load of repositories in here, and again, it's using this form of uh, the GitLab hostname. Uh, which needs to be looked up in the config. Well, if you haven't installed the personal stuff first, then none of the SSH keys or the SSH config will be loaded. So these won't work. Uh, so you've got to load the personal before the project. There you go. Uh, I got there in the end. Okay. <clears throat> so uh yeah so uh, anyway this brings me on to the, the lion's share of what i've been screwing around with uh i've been playing around with um a, apart from restructuring all of this and getting it working uh which has been interesting uh it's been a sort of iterative process of screwing around with it until i'm happy with the way it is i'm quite happy with the way it is now uh if i go to the the development machine for this though um this is the this is the other thing i've been spending a lot of time on uh which is uh two things first of all um you remember i installed the concourse as a matter of course now uh, and that's what this ci stuff is for uh, so uh, uh, i've now got uh, these these task definitions okay which are actually tasks within uh, let's do uh, patch. 
these are actually tasks within um, uh, 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 concourse uh, so so these are concourse task definition files which will eventually just be plugged into pipelines uh, to to build the whole thing and just reset this term because it's uh, <clears throat> yeah it's better uh, I've been uh, messing about with uh, running Raspberry Pi images inside uh, Queenview uh, okay, we'll get to, we'll get to that. <clears throat> okay, so so yeah, so these tasks um, are useful for uh, even at this stage um, for running in context the various tools. So you can see here that what this one does is it uses this CIU tools image, uh, uh, which I've actually got checked out because um, it's one of the things I've been screwing around with. Okay. Um, uh, and all this CIU tools is it's a base uh, um, a base uh, if I remember correctly it's a base Debian image um, uh, yeah so it's a, De it's a base Debian image um, which has just got installed a few extra tools so in this case it's got the partitioning tool UDEV tool the unzip tool and a set of scripts uh, okay, uh, and this has just got some utilities. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a utility which uh, oh, I'm jumping ahead. We'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, it, it basically creates a, a little build context, um, and. Uh, so it creates a little build context with this image, uh, which will be familiar to anybody who's used anything like Travis or anything like that, where, where you, you've got a CI build, which effectively runs um, uh, Docker containers as your as your build context, and that's all Concourse does. Concourse is built as a doer of things because uh, it's it's pretty general purpose. So this takes two inputs. It takes a pi image directory uh, and a pi patch tools directory, and it produces a pi patched image directory. And uh, so what it's expecting is this pi image will contain a file system, uh, a zip file called file system .zip, uh, which has got the uh, got the image file um, for a, a Raspberry Pi uh, install, not a noobs. It has to be um, a, what I call a proper image. Okay, um, it's, it needs to have the two two sectors: uh, the FAT32 boot sector and the primary sector, which has got the main Linux system on it, uh, kind of Debian. We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> okay, uh, and then uh, this is going to contain just the various tools that I've written. Uh, I say that I've written. Um, I stole a lot of it. <laughs> I researched it online. Um, there were a couple of guys who already worked out all the nitty gritty details. And I sort of took bits from two or three different sources. Uh, to create uh, scripts that I thought were a bit more uh, what I needed, uh, and, and this is this is good practice. Okay, uh, it's a good idea to steal other people's code. Um, uh, I will, of course, give you credit when I write this all up, and you'll find that the repositories that I've made public uh, will link you through to the originals. Um, sometimes. The scripts were either out of date because uh, they used older technology, or uh, they made certain assumptions that I didn't think were uh, okay, um, or <laughs> uh, they weren't suitable to run in the context of a, um, a Docker container. So again, it was a question of just tweaking the, the, the scripts. Uh, so rather than tweak the scripts, uh, it, it wasn't appropriate to 
uh, submit a pull request, or I'll, although I've submitted a few for various things as I've, as I've gone along. Um, but generally speaking, okay, there are, there are two ways of going about this. One is to take and fork somebody's project, uh, tweak it to your taste, and then submit pull requests back for things that are effectively defects with their stated objectives, um, or if you think it's a useful extension to what they've already done. Uh, because I was changing the context in which the tools were designed to be used, uh, it would have been, it would have required more effort to make the scripts respond to the different contexts. Uh, so rather than do that, I've just forked the project and completely reworked them. Uh, well, I say forked the project, I, I nicked the bits of code I thought were useful. Um, uh, and yeah, rewritten them, rewritten them to be useful inside the Docker container context that I needed. However, in doing that, of course, you do um, maybe in some. I don't think these actually needed that, uh, but in some cases, I've submitted a uh, pull request back where I think there is a, a genuine issue. Uh, that's just polite. Uh, right. So, really, uh, having got all these inputs, all it does is it runs this patch tool uh, called unzip and patch, which, unsurprisingly, takes the file system zip, unzips it. And it applies a patch and what this patch does is it allows the pi image to be accessed by ssh uh, which is a trivial thing to do because all you need to do is put an ssh file an empty ssh file into the uh, uh, the, the boot sector basically um, yeah. Uh, sorry, not into the no, not into boot, into the root, into the root of the uh, the main image. <clears throat> I'll have a look in a minute. Uh, which, when Pi boots, then it sees this file is present. Uh, it removes the file and it installs the SSH server daemon, which then means you can SSH in um, uh, to the machine. That's important because the next part of the process is to use SSH to uh, actually populate and configure the rest of the machine. That's the idea. Okay, uh, so so this is something that again I've been playing around with for a while, uh, and you can see here that the arguments being passed to this unzip and patch script are uh, the source image, and then telling it where to put the uh, the file. Right, so uh, let's uh, see. Right, so I've got these two directories in and out, uh, and you'll see that in is just the in directory. Out has got two subdirectories: one called crunch, uh, one called crushed. <laughs> it should say crushed, and uh, the other one called patched. Okay, uh, so. Uh, ignore the pearl, uh, it's not relevant to this current project. Um, it was needed for, uh, oh, it's needed for um, the, uh, yeah, it's needed for the um, git prompt. Uh, so if I go to pi builder, this, this sexy, uh, uh, this sexy prompt, uh, the git prompt requires it. Uh, uh, that's sort of beside the point, really. Um, Express VPN is another project. DPI is the actual. Uh, this is the the main part of the project that I'm working on. Right. Oh, it's getting exhausting so uh yeah so uh to use this um we uh the, the, the long short is all of this effort was to get a file system dot image which could then be given to queenview to run uh, <clears throat> which could then uh if, if then you're emulating the raspberry pi 
uh, and you can SSH into that Raspberry Pi to populate the rest of the image. The idea is at the end of the day, you end up with an image file, okay, and uh, that image can then be burnt onto a little SD card, uh, and that can be put into uh, a Raspberry Pi, and voila, you've got your fully configured system, right? So that's the sort of high level takeaway. The low level thing is what this was all about, um, which is uh, um, uh, yeah. So what was this all about? Uh, I wanted to give. Uh, I wanted to create a, a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and a lot of people have done this kind of thing already. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you've got a Raspberry Pi and your internet cable comes in. Okay. Uh, and this Raspberry Pi is going to act uh, as uh, um, a, a sort of uh, secure box. Okay. Now, but the first thing it's going to run is uh, Pi-hole. Uh, and Pi-hole, uh, for those of you that don't know, is uh, a sort of DNS filter. Well, not a sort of, it is a DNS filter, uh, which gets rid of all of the shite, uh, like advertising. Okay. Uh, the other thing it's going to run is a VPN. Okay. So the, the VPN uh, is always going to be running to protect the traffic going out of this box to the internet. Of course, it's going in and out by the same cable, but okay. Uh, and then other things that are going to be installed on here are uh, transmission, which is a very straightforward um, BitTorrent uh, tool, which has got a nice web interface. And uh, I'm also going to put a file manager on here. Okay, but the file manager again will have a web interface so that um, you, know, you can plug a USB stick in and transfer files to and from the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so the whole thing will be accessed through uh, a web browser. Now, the other thing I wanted to do was make it easy uh, to access this in a secure way. Right. Uh, to make sure that uh, you weren't going to contaminate uh, any part of uh, your normal using your system. So no special installs or anything like that. And the way I finally landed on doing it was having a Firefox browser okay, configured so that everything was going through uh, a SOX5 proxy, which meant that on this ingress side here, I needed... Uh, a SOX5 proxy, right? And by doing that, what it means is that this web browser, no matter what I do in this web browser, okay, I don't have to remember what IP addresses or whatever, you know, uh, I don't have to do any uh, clever modifications to it. All I need to know is that, okay, if this thing's co configured to, for SOX5, all of the traffic, whether it's browsing traffic, HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, whatever, uh, all, all my DNS lookups, everything, are going to go through this SOX5 connection, okay, into the Raspberry Pi, yeah, through this SOX5. Uh, it will then be processed by uh, the various web utilities, and anything that needs to then uh, access the internet will go out via the VPN onto uh, the big dangerous internet, right? Uh, so everything is secure. So if your, uh, uh, you know, if transmission is instructed to do a BitTorrent, it will go through the VPN. Uh, if you uh, are just browsing uh, websites, it goes out through the VPN. Now, why is this required? Well, unfortunately, a lot of ISPs in the UK uh, use uh, DNS blockers, okay, um, because apparently. Uh, uh, our government knows better than we do what we should be allowed to watch uh, or see. And of course, we all know that um, VPNs are useful also for getting around geo barriers. 
but the main reason is to get around this you know, childishness by the ISPs. So this makes it all really simple. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, so that's what we're trying to build. Now, in order to build this Pi, I didn't want to have to actually use a Raspberry Pi to do the build. Um, what I wanted to be able to do was to be able to have a, a virtual uh, Raspberry Pi, so a VR IP. Okay, and on that virtual Raspberry Pi, I wanted to be able to test all of this stuff. Okay, but before I did that, I wanted to do a proof of concept to make sure that I could get this general idea working. So I didn't want to have to worry about it being compatible with the Raspberry Pi. I just wanted it to, to run on a virtual machine. Okay, hence this virtual machine. Okay, uh, so the proof of concept was what I wanted to do was in order to make sure that everything was being routed through. Okay, there are two ways I could do it. One is I could make the VPN uh, installed on the Raspberry Pi itself. Okay, and I can install each of these applications on the Raspberry Pi itself. But it occurred to me that I could make it more sort of generic. Uh, I can make it very easy to go from the virtualized environment and so on. And this is something which is becoming increasingly uh, used uh, is the idea that you don't try to do configuration managed deploys. You just build containers and then you deploy the containers and you configure those, right? Now, some people say, oh, it's configuration loose. You know, deployment. This is horseshit. Okay, it's not. All you've done is abstracted away certain parts of the configuration. Okay, so what you've done is instead of having uh, instead of having salt uh, uh, do the configuration. Okay, uh, or, or Ansible or whatever. Okay. All you've done is you've taken the configuration, you've put it into Docker files. Okay, case in point. Uh, okay, so here's the ExpressVPN container. Uh, that's a configuration file. Uh, it, it just is. Uh, it, there's no difference between doing that uh, in principle, in, in between doing that and doing uh, you know uh, an Ansible uh, configuration it's the same fucking thing it, the only difference is the language in which you're expressing it right uh, so this is configuration just the same okay it's the same thing it's just a configuration okay and we could we could even tie these these installs of the app get down to particular versions Okay, at the moment we just, we're just taking the latest of whatever is available in the uh, in the repository. But again, uh, it's no different. It's the, it's the same principle. Okay, I could I could write this, uh, or, you know, I could write all of this. Okay, in Salt's configuration language, and I could say, right, there you go. There's the configuration for this element. Okay, call it the Express VPN state. Right. This is the same thing. The only difference is that having run this, okay, I end up with a container, and I can then take that container and apply it to whatever other context. All right. Now, over and above that, you can see here that we've got other configuration stuff. All right. Activation code and location. Now, whereas in assault configuration, okay, those would be provided at the time that I ran this configuration into a machine, they're actually deferred. Okay, and they're deferred until this entry point script runs. And this entry point script is expecting these two things. And it then configures the container. Okay, so you're still configuring it. You've still got to worry about where this information is coming from. Okay, it's either going to come from somewhere, uh, you know, like a, a key value store, like um, you know, Vault or, or Console or etc. D or whatever. Okay. Or it's going to come from uh, salt, <laughs> okay? Because salt can deploy these things as well. Or it's going to come from compose, uh, Docker compose file. Or it's going to come from you know some source, okay? So again, 
that's configuration and it needs to be controlled. So the idea that containers suddenly get you away from configuration is complete bullshit, okay? It just doesn't. It's just expressing the configuration in a slightly different way. Uh, the net result is exactly the same. You still have to do this stuff. You still have to think it through. Uh, oh. Anyway, rant over. Uh, so yeah, so here's uh, that's the ExpressVPN container, okay? And uh, this was stolen from somewhere as well. Uh, I guess somebody had already worked out all the details here. All I've done again, this was more a question of st stabilizing it, uh, which raises another issue. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, a few months ago uh, there was a big thing because uh, somebody uh, it was a github project that somebody removed uh, now this git all it did was do something it was something trivial like a, a trim yeah uh, and it was doing like a um, trim of white spaces or something like that it was it was some really trivial little bit of code uh, and so many people had used that repository okay in their projects that when this guy got removed it uh, it was a fit of peak over something i can't remember what anyway he removed this repository or made it inaccessible or something the point is that all of a sudden everybody's systems were breaking out thousands of systems around the world and some of them quite seriously big systems suddenly discovered that their builds were breaking and the reason was that this repository wasn't available anymore and it was like four or five lines of code it was nothing it was so fucking trivial okay and it was kind of like why would you use a git repository but you know that piece of code is uh, it's such a standard thing to do you know why on earth wouldn't you have written it yourself anyway point is people didn't now this was a salient lesson okay one don't use trivial bits of code from somebody's remote repository why would you do that it's insane okay two if you're going to use a remote repository, okay, it is best to fork it and use your forked version. Yes, it means that you have to, you know, do periodically, you have to pull in the upstream, you have to do a refresh of your repository and things like that, uh, which is not actually a bad thing, okay, it's just an extra bit of work. Thankfully, we have things like Concourse and Travis CI and so on that are perfectly good for doing this sort of thing. Yeah, you can have a bleeding edge build, and the first thing it does is pull in and update everything. Okay, but it does it in such a way that it pulls it in and updates away from your main code repositories. Yeah? It can then do the full build, and you can see breaks from upstream changes coming a lot earlier. Ah, oh, it's genius, I tell you. And the number of people that don't do this is just absolutely mind-boggling. But there you go. Okay, so anyway, so you can set these things up to be automated. It's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, you know, you'll sometimes you'll get breakages because you pull in a change and it, you know, it, it, there's a merge breakage or something like that. Well, tough titty. You're going to have to deal with it at some stage anyway, so you might as well find out earlier. Anyway. Yes, so use a fork version that gives you some stability. So, if somebody, one of your upstreams, says, "Oh, I'm not going to do this anymore," uh, or "I'm going to delete my repository," it doesn't break all your builds because you are not working from their repository. You're working from the fork version. Why? Oh. It, it astonishes me that people just don't think shit through. Right. So yes, always, always use a fork version. <coughs> there's even, in a commercial environment, there's a good reason not to rely even on the upstream uh, repositories for your packages. Okay, uh, You should really be thinking about having your own mirror uh, if you're an enterprise. Uh, you should have your own mirror of the repositories. Now, even if you're a reasonably uh, a modestly sized organization have a mirror okay uh, so you know you, your your mirror sits between uh, 
where are we? Mm. Your mirror. Right, so. <clears throat> uh, the idea behind all these things is to keep things stable. Okay, so here's your environment. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know, evil core or whatever. Whatever you're working for. <clears throat> okay, and this is, you know, this is the internet, and you've got GitHub, and we've got, uh, I don't know, the Debian APT repository uh, over here. <coughs> now, these things are generally not under your control. Okay, so you don't know when they're going to go down, disappear, you know. I don't know, be wiped out, whatever. You know, go out of business. But, you know, there are a million and one things that could, in theory, happen. Okay, but the point is that they are unstable. Okay, other people are making changes to them. So, right. Uh, so, within Evil Core, you can have your own Git repos. Okay, and there's nothing to stop you taking these. Uh, let's say I want to use, you know, the ABC projects XYZ dot Git. Okay, now I could create a fork within GitHub. Okay, so I could create my you know, evil core fork, uh, and that, that's doable. And if you're going to send uh, pull request back. That's probably the easiest way of doing it. So if you're if it's an open source project, uh, which it likely is, uh, <clears throat> that may be a, a, a good thing to do. Okay, but if you don't want to do that and you're willing to handcraft pull requests, then you just take this and create it in here. Okay, so this is my local slash xyz dot git okay now everyone inside evil core always refers to this repository never to the github right? okay and you can have you know within your build system you you can have all the checks you want to make sure that github is never mentioned right? so you never pull a github repository you always pull from your local repository you know, evil core dot co whatever right? uh, the same thing goes for your repositories. Okay, this uh, yeah, the Debian repository can be mirrored, uh, and you can use something like Aptree uh, uh, or JFrog if you are incredibly rich. Okay, but Aptree uh, will do fine. Okay, and you can create your own Debian mirror. Now all of your machines, wherever they are, refer to your uh, mirror. Okay, and your your mirror can even be cleaner than the Debian one because of course they have to cater to everybody and you just have to cater to the things that you want your organization to have. So if there are certain parts of the Debian installations that you don't want ever to have available, you can just clean them out of your local repository. And again, you know, you can make sure that your local machines and this this comes down to using uh uh you know, your your devops monitoring software okay uh, to make sure that your uh your uh apt source lists don't contain references other than to your local okay so if somebody needs to access a specific you know development version of a piece of code Okay, in development, they might refer to, you know, the dev APT, wherever that is, okay? But before it goes into your build system, they need to mirror that, okay, and make it available internally, right? So this acts as your buffer. Right? It's a buffer against the volatility out here. And it's a buffer against these things being unavailable for whatever reason. Yeah, maybe your internet's gone down, or maybe uh, you know these things are not available. Um, now, if you've got this buffer, who cares? Okay, ninety-nine times out of a you know, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, you, know, you you don't need to have the bleeding edge. And if you do, like I said, there's no reason why you can't have a CI task. 
Yeah, the sole purpose is to pull these things in and do the updates, notify you of potential merge problems, which you're going to get, yeah, uh, you know, anyway. Yeah, if you're referring to directly, you're going to get these merge problems anyway. So you might as well pick it up in a CI job, yeah, and that keeps it traceable. So the CI job does the pull, or it does the Aptree update, right? Uh, and then you can either make those things immediately available, or, like I said, your CI job can run all of your builds, yeah, make sure that all of your tests are passing, and if they are, then it says, right, fine, make that available on you know the, the new development stream or master or whatever. Similarly with this, it can release the mirror, make it available to all your upstream machines, which can then do the relevant update right, to pull it in. Uh, which again is is another CI job to update your environments. Yeah. So you, you can also make the hell out of this shit, but it's lazy. It's lazy to rely on external sources, and we know that it will make your life miserable when somebody does something trivial like you know get rid of it. Uh, get rid of a, uh, an upstream. <clears throat> we'll talk about all of these things when I get back to talking about DevOps. Uh, in, in, in the ongoing saga. Right? And we'll talk about how to set these things up and make sure that they're all okay. Do you need to do it if you're a one-man band? You don't need to. Is there a reason not to? Uh, uh, I suppose this storage, I mean, certainly, uh, I don't know how big the Debian repository is nowadays. It's, uh, uh, let's do Debian mirror size. Uh, here we go. Uh, so we're talking about oh, three terabytes, and that's for everything, you know, all all platforms, including the source codes. Okay, so uh, with an excess of caution, uh, we probably want to double that. Yeah, six terabytes. I mean, come on, six terabytes. Uh, I mean, other than the problem of actually getting six terabytes across the internet, but if you're working on an enterprise network, six terabytes across the it, it's not that big a deal. Uh, we can also, that we said, uh, CD archive mirroring. Ooh. Yeah, if you really wanted it. Uh, again, you know, the chances are that you're going to need what the maybe the 386. Uh, or the AMD64 repository, the ARM64 repository, maybe, uh, if you've got mobile stuff going on. Uh, you, you may or may not want the source repository. Uh, but let's say, let's say you wanted uh, AMD64, and this, so you're talking about 7, 800 gig, no, so you're talking about a terabyte. Uh, it's just not that much space. Yeah. Um, you're talking about a terabyte of space, uh, and that gets you uh, the stability that you need. Uh, uh, right, where was I? Yes, proof of concept. So, um, Yes, so in order to make sure, because the, the main thing about this is to make sure that we're not leaking. Okay, so we don't want anything leaking. So we don't want DNS queries from uh, the Pi hole leaking uh, around the VPN. Um, and we don't want uh, any, uh, yeah, we don't want the BitTorrent, and we don't want the, uh, anything we access through the Firefox. We don't want it leaking around the VPN out onto the internet. So, one way of doing it um, consistently is to use Docker. Yeah? So we can we can actually have um, a series of Docker containers. 
okay that all share the same network okay and in in docker speak okay uh, we would put them all inside the same um, bridge and we would make sure that all the traffic stayed within that bridge and the only traffic that crossed it would be uh, the ingress traffic coming through the SOC 5 uh, and the egress or outgoing traffic okay which would go out via the VPN right? so it's easy enough to check that stuff coming in and out of this bridge is what we expect it to be right? uh, uh, and therefore we can check it's not uh, not leaking uh, when, we, when we need to uh, so these containers how do we get all these containers inside the same bridge well there are several ways uh, but it turns out that the easiest way uh, uh, if I, uh, okay so I've set up this docker compose this is just the beginning of it by the way I've not I've not gone into any great detail about uh, about I haven't fully tested this so if you see a mistake <laughs> by all means contact me and let me know uh, but all I've done at the moment, okay, is I've set up. Uh, I'll go back to. Uh, it's going to be a quicker way of going back to this. Uh, just bear with me a second. Uh, oh, there's a key to get me to that. Uh, let me see. Uh, what's the hot key to go to? Document. There we go. Switch to scene. All right. Let's do. Uh, Will that work? There we are. Mm. Oh, that was unsuccessful. No, oh, right, well, I'll worry about that later. Right. So, who was I? Mm, train of thought, train of thought, train of thought. Yeah, so, so all I've really done uh, so far is I've put the a pie hole on and got that working. I've got the SOC5 ingress and I've got the VPN as uh, VPN as the egress. Okay, so you see here I've got three services ingress, pie hole, and egress. Right? Now the way they share their uh, their bridge is using this network mode. Okay, and within Docker Compose there is a service network mode. And what this does is it says that this container, the ingress container, and this container, the pie hole container, uh, the, the, sorry, this service rather, because the, the names of the containers are different. This service, ingress service, and this service, pie hole, should, say, should share their network stack okay, with this service, which is the egress. You'll notice here that this doesn't have uh, the network mode on it, okay, because these two are sharing this machine's network stack. Now, what that means in effect is that for the network traffic that's going in and out of uh, what would be the bridge set up for uh, these containers, okay, uh, uh, all the traffic will flow through uh, this, uh, well, technically, this container's network interface okay which is defined as the, as, as the um, VPN okay so if this goes down for some reason if the VPN becomes disconnected okay then these machines won't be able to connect because they're sharing uh, they're sharing the network okay now uh, the other thing is that this SOC 5 okay is the ingress so this is the container that's get, gonna uh, get stuff coming in okay and it's a very simple this is again you can see here i'm being a bit naughty because i haven't yet remember what i was talking about earlier <laughs> okay i haven't yet made my own mirror of this sock 5 um container okay but again this is proof of concept so i'm allowed to do that <laughs> in my final production version It'll be a salty vagrant SOC 5 okay so uh, but the point is that this SOC 5 is actually a very uh, a simple little go program uh, that just presents a SOC 5 proxy now 
what you'll notice is that this isn't advertising any ports which you might think is odd because normally I would advertise the port the 1080 port which is the SOC 5 port I would be advertised from this container because this would be the one that I wanted to go uh, and be able to connect to however it's down here okay so I've advertised the 1080 port down here under egress right. that's the outgoing service but that's because again it's because the network mode is that every all of the networking stuff is coming through this container so I have to advertise the port here in 1080 mm -hmm. uh, I think that port 80 I can do without now uh, I think it was put in there for testing naughty anyway uh, it, it doesn't matter anyway because I'll show you in a minute how the Firefox connects to this um, so 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 what we've got here then is we've got effectively um, uh, so what we've got here is we've got a, a docker set a, a docker compose okay which is going to set up schematically uh, the network is going to be the egress network is effectively going to sit here and these other two containers will sit inside it as far as the network is concerned they're still separate okay they're separate containers and they're not actually nested like this but from a network point of view they are so this egress is going to advertise the 1080 port which is going to be our outgoing port and it's going to punch out itself the VPN All right. now there's a wrinkle to this um that we'll see in a minute and the wrinkle is this uh first of all this express vpn okay uh of necessity will modify uh, some of the files on the file system one of those files being uh, uh, it's it's this entry point I think yeah so here you can see okay uh, these three lines here oops. okay so easy uh, so these three lines here okay um, are making the uh, resolve conf editable or making certain it can be edited uh, and won't be dicked over by uh, the uh, docker engine okay so resolve conf uh, for those of you that don't know is the file which is used to determine things like which name servers you should refer to uh, for uh, dns name resolution uh, and without wanting to go into a lot of detail this is the process which maps for example you know google.com to an ip address 216. Blah, blah, blah. okay now uh, expressvpn uh, needs to update that because one of the things it will do is write into that um, a new uh, dns name uh, name server okay which will be the one provided by the vpn provider uh, this is all a part of the effort to prevent dns name uh, dns leaking okay because dns leaking is when uh, uh you're trying to you're trying to use a vpn right uh, so you're trying to use a vpn uh, and you access you know a a a farming okay a host okay so you're on you're on your, your web browser okay and you enter uh, google.com okay and for some reason okay your isp has decided that it's it's blacking uh, it's blocking uh, we're not supposed to say blacklist now we're supposed to say blocklist okay whatever pc 
Um, so google.com is on the lock list, right? So the ISP, its DNS, uh, will return uh, you know, uh, uh, a not found, or a, a, in, in most cases, it will return a standard page that says, you know, you're not allowed to access this. Actually, let's make it more realistic. Uh, the Pirate Bay, uh, what is it nowadays? Uh, let's do .com. I don't think it is anymore. I think it's .org or .se or something. So the, the Pirate Bay. Right? So you actually you try to access it, and your ISP uh, is blocking the Pirate Bay. Right? So it returns and it says, "No, uh, there's no such thing as a Pirate Bay. You're not allowed to access the Pirate Bay." Blah blah blah. So your browser will show a no, you're not allowed to access this. So you say, well, that's no problem. I'll just use a VPN. Now my ISP is none the wiser, okay? Because my VPN tunnel will get me through to uh, you know uh, Google servers, okay, eight dot eight dot eight dot eight or whatever, or through to one dot one dot one dot one, which is the um, uh, uh, <laughs> cloud net doesn't sound right anyway it will get through to another server right but again these uh, might decide the the pirate bay is not allowed either uh, now most vpns will promise you uh you know we we are not uh, going to censor anything, blah, 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 blah. So what they do is they provide, you know, uh, 10.116. blah, 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 blah. They'll provide their own DNS server, okay? And when you connect to your uh, VPN, okay, uh, your DHCP client will request uh, an IP address for your machine on their internal network. And as part of that, it will be given a name server. Whatever. Okay, so you'll refer to this name server. You'll bypass all of these others potentially blocked mail server, mail server name servers. DNS leaking is when, for some reason, your request to your DNS doesn't go through your VPN. Uh, and so what happens is, although your traffic, the actual traffic backwards and forwards, okay is um encrypted and can't be looked at by your isp because your dns is leaking and it's coming around the side of your vpn okay your isp can still see it and it will therefore block it or otherwise track what you're doing uh yeah so that's the reason why uh, we need to be careful to make sure that this is set up this way so that the VPN is the be all and end all, all traffic goes through it. Uh -huh. Right, so, um, yes, so, yes, so that was the, yes, yeah, so it edits the result, uh, yeah, so the VPN is changing the resolve.com um, so that uh, uh, the, any DNS requests at this level will go through the VPN. Cool. So far, so good. And it will go to their, their DNS server. Now, there's a bit of a wrinkle to all of this stuff. Uh, and it may actually be a bug. It doesn't occur to me until just now. But the, the wrinkle is this. Having set this up, what I discovered is that um, this pie hole uh, it, it doesn't really matter for the ingress because the ingress uh, isn't really serving anything. Uh, so all all, it, all, it, all this ingress container is, it's just acting as a as a proxy. So it's just a gateway. It's just handing all of its traffic off to the rest of this system. But the pie hole uh, is principally there to act as your uh, domain name resolver. Uh, and it does pretty much what your VPN was doing, uh, or sorry, your ISP was potentially doing, okay? But it's doing it under your control. So your uh, web browser makes a request for a page, 
Okay, and the point hog will look it up and see whether it's on the blacklist or not. And if it's on the blacklist, it will send back or not send back, depending on how you configured it, uh, a response uh, appropriate, uh, an appropriate response. Right? Um, uh, by default, and certainly the way this is set up, it will just not send back anything. Okay, it will it will just ignore the request. Uh, and what will happen is your browser will say, "I haven't got a, re a response back in a timely fashion," so the page doesn't exist. Now, now that can cause some problems with page rendering, so we may modify that. Uh, but there are good reasons for doing it. Uh, uh, the Pi-hole uh, documentation actually covers all of this. There are there are three, three or four different modes you can set up, uh, and they're case specific, and they've all got pros and cons depending on what you want to actually achieve. But by default, it just won't send anything back at all. Uh, in, in fact, what it sends back is zero dot zero dot zero slash zero, which is a uh, an invalid address uh, for any response. Okay, so you, you you nothing by convention nothing can respond to that address. So it's a it's a null response. So you do get something come back, kind of. Uh, Again, we'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, so what Pi-hole does is it acts as um, a, a kind of intermediary. Okay, so your request comes in. Okay, so your so your request comes into Pi-hole um, uh, on port fifty-three, which is your DNS request. Okay. Uh, Pi-hole will then look up whether it's on the blacklist. If it's on the blacklist, it will send back a 0 0.0.0.0 0 .0 .0 slash 0, okay, uh, which effectively says, bugger off, uh, yeah, this doesn't exist. Now, the whole point about Pi-hole in the first instance is to block things like advertisers and trackers. Right? And so, for example, DoubleClick and, and companies like that, uh, all of these are pieces. Something in the order of eighty, is it eighty-two thousand domains that are on the block list now? So Pi-hole maintains that block list. Okay, and it, it just blocks trackers and all that kind of shite. You know, so it blocks all the Google Analytics stuff. Essentially, what by sending back this null address, uh, what it's doing is it's stopping your web browser from asking that question. Okay, it just you know it just won't do anything with it. Uh, side note, it can break your websites, but um, generally speaking, it doesn't. Uh, they fail gracefully, typically. And my attitude is, if they're not going to fail gracefully, I don't want to be visiting them. I'll go somewhere else. Uh, yes, so, but what happens if Pi-hole, it's not on Pi-hole's uh, blacklist? Well, Pi-hole still needs to re resolve that name, okay? It doesn't know about every name on the internet. So what it does is it simply passes the request on, okay? So it's sort of like a, a, a pass-through in that respect. So Pi-hole will now make another request, okay? Again, on 53, to whatever you've configured within Pi-hole to be your downstream DNS server. And this is where things get tricky, right? Okay, there are several issues here. Um, let's let's do the the easy one first, okay? So Pi-hole, you can specify a primary and a secondary downstream DNS, okay? So I think by default they are eight 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 and eight eight four four. I think. Okay, so basically the Google servers. Okay, so they get passed on. And they will go out through your through our VPN to 888. Now you'll notice now that these two things are not our VPN provided DNS. In fact, that will be completely ignored. It's just not not used. Well, and that's not technically true. It's used for the very first queries by, for example, Pi-hole when it's starting up uh, in order to download, for example, the latest block lists. Um, 
but that's not really much help to us. Okay, so one of the things I've got to do is I've got to find out where these values are held in the configuration files so that I can patch in whatever the VPN provides back to me. That's a project for next week or so. Um, and it may be just as easy to do it manually because uh, the, 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 the VPN is not going to move around the DNS servers that. Uh, hmm. ah, well, we'll worry about that in a bit. In a bit. Uh, it, it'd be better to make it so that it was automated. Okay, so that's the that's the first problem is is these two. Okay, to to make sure that these two are uh, suitably um, uh, set. So that our DNS is going, our requests are going out to things that we trust. I mean, frankly, passing them out to Google is not that big a deal. Um, and if you're that worried, then pass them out to CloudFront. CloudFront, that was the name I was trying to think of. CloudFront, uh, one, one, one. Uh, or a DNS of your choice. Uh, right, the second problem, and this one's a bit more tricky, is uh, the problem of uh, what pie hole actually, uh, or how the uh, this ingress service, uh, uh, so how this ingress uh, gets to the pie hole in the first place. Right? So um, uh, how the the fifty threes, you know, the the, the uh, uh, how the DNS request gets to the pie hole and this is where the resolve comes in again you remember that uh, our egress vpn uh, modifies the resolve.conf the problem is that that is not the same resolve conf as seen in the pie hole or in the egress in the ingress okay those are set by docker and they're usually set to 127.0.0.11 which is an, uh, an internal uh, an internal address which is all, all well and good but what it doesn't resolve to is it doesn't point to the pie hole, which is exactly what what it does it points to an internal dns service okay so it's the it's the docker dns okay so what happens is the uh the, the packet comes in okay from uh your browser through the ingress okay your in the ingress it, it, it doesn't really apply to the ingress because the ingress is not running an operating system it's literally just running a process in isolation uh, but it will get, get to the pie hole right? uh, and before the pie hole is fully configured it it, it won't get to, it won't get to the pie hole but, okay I've got, i'm confusing everybody including myself right here's the problem uh, the packet is coming in Right, but the, the pie hole is not uh, is not in the resolve.conf. So the system says, "Well, where should I get my DNS name resolution from?" Uh, uh, and the way where it won't get it from is it won't get it from pie hole, which is uh, attached to you know one twenty seven or whatever. Uh, I suppose, actually, if I would, if I were to externalize the port, it would probably be okay. Uh, but I can't externalize it to attach to uh, the anywhere in here. Uh, so uh, I would have to externalize it and advertise it externally. Anyway, long story short, the easiest way to deal with it right, was to have the pie hole uh, modify its own resolve.conf. So that the name server, instead of being the Docker name server, would just be 127.0.0.1. Right? That was just a really, really long-winded way of saying uh, that when I put the um, uh, when I put the uh, when I put the uh, where are we? 
All right, so when I put this together, all right, uh, I needed to have this script uh, which would simply bully the etc. resolve.conf to be 127.0.0.1, which would ensure that the pi hole was being used to resolve the local uh, DNS request. Okay, now obviously you can't you can't do that until PyHole is actually running. All right. Uh, so you have to make sure that this script gets run after PyHole has started. Fortunately, PyHole uses a system called uh, S6. Okay, and S6 is a sort of user space version of the old init system uh, where it runs uh, uh, it, it runs through scripts in specific directories in the order in which they appear. Uh, and that means uh, uh, so, so you can see here, this is very simple. All this does is it just copies this into this uh, init.d file. Okay. Uh, and it relies otherwise on the pile. Right. So if I go to the pile project, okay, it's got this Xis, uh, S6 system, <coughs> which has got the startup scripts. Uh, for pile yeah. uh, okay so this is the startup script pile and that's script 20 so as long as my script has a higher number than 20 it will be run after pile is started hurrah lashings of ginger beer all around okay so it was fairly easy to add this patch in so what happens now is uh, and we get a bit of leakage here okay because for whatever reason well not for whatever reason um <laughs> but here's what happens uh, during pihole startup it is it, it's going to make at least one request okay and it's going to request the updated block list uh, the first time it starts up right so it's going to make that request now to resolve the dns uh, the, the domain name for that request it's going to use whatever the resolve.com says in the container that contains the pie hole and that is going to be the default docker okay so 127.0.0.11 right so the that that request is going to go out via via the docker mm -hmm. Okay, so so the fir the very first request as Pihole is starting up, okay, so it's going to come into Pihole, but it's going to go out via the Docker DNS, yeah, not out via the VPN. All right. Uh, especially if there's a race uh, because what i haven't done yet is i haven't made the pile dependent on the vpn being up and maybe i should do that first hmm. anyway once pile started right, uh, and he's and he's doing its thing right from then on uh, because we've patched the uh, because we've patched the uh, resolve.conf in the in that container okay it will now anything coming in will will get bounced back to uh, the pi which is bound to the 127.0.0.153 port uh -huh. oh blimey uh, and then and then pi will work correctly so what's the upshot of all this gobbledygook well, the upshot is that if we do, uh, I don't think it's running at the moment. No, concourse is, but this isn't. So if we do dot compose up, okay, 
and this will actually so you can see here it's starting the pi hole and it's starting the VPN okay it would be better I think uh, to have a dependency between the pi hole and the VPN so the VPN was already started and everything was all up and ready right so you can see here okay Blah, blah, blah. So this is my script to patch it, okay. uh, and because I haven't uh, demonized this, it will just sit there like a lemon. Uh, if I now go to my uh, Firefox browser. Uh, 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 So I've got, I've got a Firefox browser installed on this machine, which I have previously configured. Uh, so the way this is configured uh, is under the network settings. Uh, okay, it will uh, it will go through uh, Sox Five. Uh, uh, actually, no, uh, <laughs> no, I turned this off because I. Uh, I instead I went through the uh, foxy proxy because uh, I was playing around with this stuff. So you can see here this is a SOC 5, RPI SOC 5, 127. That's the only thing that's turned on. <coughs> okay, uh, all, all the other things. I, I should really turn the whole thing off. Uh, so, yes, so this is saying, right, send all your traffic through the RPI SOC proxy. Right, uh, so if I now go here and do a check of my config 185 right uh, whereas on my standard uh, this is my normal um, what do you, if I do all the config need for my regular machine you can see that my IP is 86 uh, Uh, which probably isn't a really good idea to show you, but never mind. Uh, it, it's all it's all movable feast anyway. Uh, yeah, so uh, going back to my uh, sorry, yeah, uh, going back over here. Okay, so this is my Firefox. So this is now going through my through the VPN. Okay, completely different IP address. Uh, and and now on 127, okay, I can actually access my. Uh, uh, I can access my file, and you can see it's already started uh, some blocking. But this was uh, a, a while ago now. Uh, if I go to uh, it, this is just a random page I hit. But, uh, if I reload it, okay, and then reload this. Okay, so here you go. Do, 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 do. Loads of stuff. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so this has all been blocked. Yeah, the Google Tag Services uh, stuff has all been blocked. Right. And it's allowed through uh, some Facebook stuff. Although, frankly, I might add Facebook to my own personal block list. Uh, and here you can see, here we go. So here are the 83,000 domains on the actual block list. Okay, and this is just stuff that I've just blocked. Uh, and this is all exclusively uh, attached to that. Uh, virtual machine. Uh, right, okay. So anyway, that was a very, very long way uh, of bringing you up to date um, with some of the stuff I've been playing with over the last week or so. Uh, it's been interesting because it, uh, it, the thing is, right, that uh, over here, um, Right, so now uh, you can see here we've got these you've got the, the separate things running okay so this is my express VPN this is my v, and this is my socks five right 
Now we can't connect a, um, a shell to SOX5 because uh, it's it's just running this one Go program uh, in the context of it. So it's just using the underlying kernel, but it's just running the one SOX program, uh, which is just my, my ingress. Okay, but I can attach the pie hole. Okay, uh, so I can do something like uh, docker execute. Um, uh, Something vagrant, so uh, uh, okay. I think, uh, can I just do pile? Uh, I want to connect to bin bash. Bastard. Oh, come on, what am I doing wrong now? Uh, oh, I misspelled something. Okay. That was just me being a dumbass. It is just exit. <coughs> right. What have I been typing execute in for? Well, not that it really matters. Right. So now we're inside the docking container. Okay, so you can see uh, this is, uh, you see that uh, S6 int? Uh, that's the startup process. Yeah? But what we're really interested in is things like uh, the routing information. Okay, so you can see that this, uh, the, the routing information, remember, is coming from the egress. Okay, so we're actually going out through this 10166, which is the VPN. Okay, so this is, if you remember, although we're in the, uh, although we're in the pie hole, uh, the routing information is saying, no, go through the VPN. Okay, uh, and we can... Uh, we can even, uh, yeah, we'll have a look at it in a minute, right? But uh, if I look at cat etc slash resolve dot conf, yeah, it's got this 127.001. Okay, now if I now go to uh, uh, VPN egress, which is the, the VPN machine, okay. And I go and I do the IP route on there, you'll see it's the same thing because it's using the same network stack, remember, because of the network mode. Okay, so again, this, that's kind of cool, right? But it's still, okay, if I now do search for resolve, you can see this is completely different because it's the one that's been loaded in from uh, uh, the VPN from the VPN provider, okay, and it's loaded in their name server at ten one six zero one. Uh, ideally, I want that information to be propagated to the other containers. Now, by making all of the other containers dependent on the uh, this container. There are a couple of ways I can conceive of doing it. Neither, one of which is terrible, and that is to make the etc. into a volume. Well, that would just break everything in a horrible way, because you can't share that between all the different containers and have it make any kind of sense, I don't think. Uh, you can't just share the individual result at comp file. Uh, outside of Docker, I could wait for the event and then maybe interrogate it. Uh, the other way, and probably the way to go, is to do a DHCP query from within the other containers in order to find out the, you know, because you can do something like, um, uh, 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 what is it, DH client, is it DH client daemon? Uh, is, is that right? No. Uh, 
how would you, there, there is a way of doing um, there there are there are several ways of doing the query uh, to try and find out the name server coming from the DHCP server, which will be the uh, the one provided by the ISP. And then use that information to then write the etc file. So instead of that script, uh, instead of that script just mangling, you know, blindly into one twenty seven dot zero dot one, it can mangle it to something interesting. That, however, would cause the bypass of pie hole. Mm. But if I look at, uh, it, you see, uh, th this directory is actually mounted. Yeah, I know, mate. I'm going to get you to know it. You see here, uh, if I look at uh, uh, pie hole, right, what I want to find is in here, okay, uh, uh, oh, look, dnsservers.com. Perfect. Uh, if this is nice and simple. Oh, that's, that's cracking, that is. Okay, so that's the DNS servers. How do I specify which one is to be used? Because uh, all that is is oh, oh, sorry, mate. Oh. Um, so these are these are just the okay. Well, let's have a look at the uh, pile hole configuration. Okay, so if we go to setting, how do I set the DNS? So DNS. Here we go. Uh, ah, so I can select from one of N. Hmm. But I can, I, ah, so I can set a custom. Okay, well, let's set a custom. Uh, Now that's interesting. That is interesting. Yes. So if if this is to be believed, if it's only listening on Ethernet zero. Mind you. In this particular, uh, if it's only listening on Ethernet zero, one twenty seven dot zero dot one is effectively going to be the same thing in this context. But yeah, this is going to require a bit of thinking about. However, let's just enter a custom. Uh, so went to one dot one dot one dot one, which is meaningless really because i could have just selected cloudflare but what i want to try and do uh, interesting ah so it's identified it is cloudflare okay so it's really uh, was it 10 10 dot one one six was it was it one one six? No, one six six. Zero dot one, which is actually the the one we really wanted to use. Obviously, I don't want to have to go through this every time. Okay, so now I've actually got the custom IP address in there. Let's see how that has affected. 
Uh, uh, it affected this. Oh, yeah, I think it has. No, so these are just the standard ones. So, uh, Pie hole. Mm. Has it changed the configuration? Uh, Kenny, you're going to really chuck me off, mate. Mm. Uh. Mm. Uh, I've got a horrible feeling it's going to be buried in one of these databases. Uh, but uh, ah, here we go. No, excellent. Okay, so all I need to do then is remove all of those and just have pihole DNS one result. Uh, so the only tricky bit now is going to be getting that uh, DNS entry. So, just shits and giggles, let's just have a quick look. Uh, right, uh, DHCP query name server. Let's see whether there's a way of. I'm sure there is. Okay, so. No, I'm actually querying it. Uh, Uh, oh, come on, Kenny, don't mess about. In order to find a DNS and log on log. Uh, not interesting. Not interesting. If you, if you step on my keyboard, I'm going to knock your head off. I'm just joking. I'm not going to know. But I am going to be cross. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Ah, NM tool. NM tool. I doubt very much if that's installed. Let's just install. No, so where do I get that from? Uh, I uh, can't use that trick because, of course, I don't have access to the. The thing is, right, I don't have access to the file system uh, in the neighboring container. Uh, okay, so let's try and find it. So we want the Debian package. Or NM tool. Uh, oh, no, never manager. Nobody gives a shit. God. Oh, no, never manager. Good God. That, that's a horrible thing. I don't want to get tied up in that. There should be a way of. should be a way of just repeating the DHCP query for God's sake. Uh, uh, 
It's your dinner time anyway, and that's why you're playing up. Uh, oh, Windows, nobody cares about Windows. Uh, and that tests the DHC. This. Your DHCP from the Line. Now, if that's why I want it. <gasps> Ooh, the question network parameters without the IP address. Turns the parameters of the network you're connected to. The ACP agent will connect to the DHP server and request for the information. The command is mostly used for networks which computers have static addresses assigned to them. Uh, now the question is, if I do that, if I do that, is that going to Screw things up. Ah, let's go back into the. Uh, where am I? Um, uh, oops. Oh, what happened there? Uh, oh. It's a team I don't want to be in there. Oh. Alright, uh, Attach. Alright, uh, Right, so what I want to do is uh, control R Docker. There we go. Right, so uh, this is, uh, I don't think this will be. I have company. Uh, uh, Turn zero. Shift in form. Okay. How do you do it with IP root two? Hmm. Uh, blah 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 blah. Hmm. No. I mean that's a possibility I guess. I don't want to install shot. There's got to be a way of doing it. DH client commands. Mm. And get the lease. Uh, put up, put up, put up. Do what I don't want to do is what I don't want to. I don't want to actually 
renewally something like that. I just I just want to do a query. Uh, Minus N minus N won't configure the interface. Good. So if I do DH client minus N times zero. Really? Okay, so do it again. Mm. Okay, so it's just the is it? ISC DHCP client. Oh, fuck it, let's just install that. Let's see what we get. DHCP dash client. Okay, DHC client or D DH client. No interface can have minus N. That wasn't very friendly, was it? Uh, okay. Oh, you bastards. There is no N option on this version. Is a capital N. Hmm. Did it install the right? No. Boss. Awesome. Okay, let's see whether this is any more informative. Uh that one says there is an N. Okay. Uh. Hmm. I can do no wait. Uh. 
Serena S. Perform an information only request. Hmm. Only valid with the minus six and all. Oh. Oh, look up to that. Okay, so I can do an information only request. Uh, well, that's a bit rude, isn't it? Uh, okay, so uh, what are the other options? DVRXI. Which are not documented. Okay. So DH client. Um, I think this is this says there's a minus n, so what the fuck is it think I'm running? Hmm. This is a Debian. Okay. Uh, quiet for those. Uh, minus N. Hmm. Okay, that's obviously going to need a bit of research. But in principle, it should be possible. So the idea is, as you can see, the idea is to read that and then uh, to patch the PyHole configuration file. Now, there is a problem. And that is, the first time you run this, that file doesn't exist. So the question is, if I just change that file, um, hmm, ah, expecting that to be mapped into that. Uh, Uh, okay, so maybe maybe it was a good idea to find out. Uh, 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 
Um, dog bar. Right, where does it mount? Where are those two volumes defined? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's map to a social pile. Why am I in the wrong? Oh, I'm in the wrong container. Idiot. That, that explains a lot. Okay. Now the question is: Is this thing just monitoring this file, or? Okay, so evidently you need to uh, nudge nudge pile again, or I mean there might not be a uh, there might be a form submission going on here. Hmm. Uh, is there a form submission going on? Uh, okay. It's just a submit. Hurrah! We could, we could probably just fake this, couldn't we? Hmm. Okay, so this, this is the form. So all we need to do is find the fields in there. And we can fake a submission. Oh, you. Yeah. That probably turns out to be a nightmare because of things like this. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, that's, that's not going to work. I mean, you can just restart I, I guess. Um, there must be a, de a place where that default is held. If there is, uh, so what we need to do is find out where those setup roles are. 
setup. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think that would be. Okay. But the good news is there is a place. Uh, there is a place that we can fiddle with. So all we can do now is decide whether or not we need to uh, prod eye hole in some way, or whether we can affect the template for those vars before pie hole is actually created. Uh, let's just uh, okay. So in here, is there? A, No, oh, it's just for the tests. Um, for the Docker file, starts with the pile base. Okay, let's go to That's where it gets set up.
during basic install. Okay, so I guess set up during basic install. We can define okay, so before we run the start, we can define these two variables. Hmm. Okay, so okay, so what we need to do is before start script define. Uh, underscore dns underscore underscore two really only needs to be one so we need to define that environment variable before we run the pyhole script and that's no problem because we did, we create a dependency Okay, so that should be fairly straightforward. Yeah. So what we need to do is we need to make pyhole depend on egress to make sure it's up and running. Then, as part of this, we need to define, presumably, uh, and now we can't do it in here because at this point we won't know. But what we can do. If we can make it part of the script, so, so we run a script before the 20 start sh, which will define DNS. So that during the run, okay, and that script can then interrogate the DHCP for. for the DNS server's IP address, and we can substitute that in instead of whatever the current default is. He said, hopefully. I suppose the proof of concept is uh, to add that depends uh, and to just add a script into our image that just hard codes in a DNS server. And make sure that that all propagates through properly. If that works, then we can worry about the. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, we've got a plan, so we'll try that next time, shall we?